Continuing on in uh, our study, follow me. We've been walking through the book of Matthew as the Lord leads. I believe he's using it, though often thought of as a book to the Jews where Christ is trying to reach the Jews and Matthew is a sympathizer of the Jews and therefore brings in all sorts of Old Testament scriptures and prophecies and tries to really highlight that side of things. I believe that's the the common understanding. I have found ever since I read those verses, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. It seems to me that Matthew is a discussion of following Christ and being made conformable unto his image, seeking after the things that he seeks, loving the things that he loves, and as a result, becoming a fisher of men. Christ came to seek and to save that which is lost, and if you follow Christ, you too will be able to, by his power, seek and save that which is lost. Catching fish, as it were. Philippians chapter 3, and again I said today we're following on that study. Follow me as revealed. Follow me as revealed. It could be titled just, Follow me. Follow me. But here we're discussing how Christ has been revealed in the knowledge of him. Philippians chapter 3, let's look in verse 8. It says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He counts here, the Apostle Paul, everything but loss. Now he discusses here and in other chapters that he is of pretty high prestige as far as Judaism goes. Verse 5, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless, but what things were gained to me, those counted I lost for Christ. And he says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He's saying that all of the things that men would revere me for, my, we- my excellent stock, my heritage, my position, my job, my, my zealousness for the law, and-, and my blamelessness in keeping it righteously. All these things the world would look at as gain, but I'm counting those lost for what? The excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He says, I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Look at the comparison. All those things that were gain are but dung compared to winning Christ and the knowledge of him, knowing him. Verse 9, it says, And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And look at this. That I may know him. That I may know him. Bottom line, I may know him was Paul's desire. Everything was lost, but that he could know Christ. Turning from and refusing all things, that he could know Christ and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. Paul desired to know Christ and have him revealed in him through the power of the resurrected life and through the fellowship of his sufferings. And Paul certainly went through some sufferings in his life and in his ministry. Even knowing the power of his resurrection is at times, I think he was beaten with an inch of his life and rose again, as it were, to go and charge back into those same cities and preach the gospel. He knew Christ through the fellowship of the suffering. He knew Christ and the power of his resurrection through his forsaking all, following him. Verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained either were already perfect, but I follow after. I follow after, if that I may apprehend that which I am also apprehended of. He's saying, I want to be apprehended, caught by the same thing that I am chasing after. I'm chasing after God, and I want God to just grab a hold of me. I want to be apprehended of Christ Jesus, even as I'm following after and trying to apprehend and know him and be intimate with him and love him and and have that knowledge of him counted to my account. He says in verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. And that's a good position to be in. To count yourself not having made it. Not having arrived. Not having it all figured out. Not apprehending the goal at the end of your life. The the finish line to the race, as it were. I haven't apprehended that. 
And when you have that attitude, you constantly follow after these things. He says, but this one thing I do, and this is important to our walk, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if anything be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. So here the Apostle Paul highlights that his desire is to know Christ. He said, let's be a follower in verse 7. Be a follower, believers, together with the Apostle Paul. And you can go to the Apostle Paul at any time and find out where he's headed and what his direction is and what his desire was. And he says, follow me as I follow Christ. So go to the letters that Paul wrote. Go to and see what his heart was. And his heart was that we would all walk by that same rule. We would all mind the same things, that our mind would be conformed to Christ. We would know him, not just in facts, but in faith. Trusting Him, believing in Him, attaining Him, literally trying to get after and grab a hold of and apprehend Christ, even as He is trying to apprehend us. Follow me. Seek me, He says, and I will seek unto you, believers. Followers together with Him were to look for our Savior, and that highlight is by there of seeking Him. Seeking Him always. And when you think of that, you think of that verse that says, In all of our ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. Now, going back to Matthew, now that we've got a little bit of a, an inkling of Paul's desire and heart in this matter, if we go back to Matthew, and we're now in chapter 16, <clears throat> look, Paul's bottom line goal was that he could know Christ and have fellowship with Christ in the things that they had common one with another. Look, I can't fellowship with Christ in his godhood. I can't fellowship with Christ in his eternity from where I'm standing. I can't fellowship with Christ in his miracles necessarily, but I can certainly fellowship with Christ in his, his um, sufferings, right? I can suffer the same way as Christ did upon this earth, and that's what Paul experienced. We can have commonality with Christ in certain ways. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 16, I'm going to begin in verse 13, where the Bible reads, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So the question is asked, Who do men say Jesus is? Who are men saying that Christ is? The answer here are plain. There's John the Baptist. Men are calling you John the Baptist. Remember Herod, he had that example where he saw the miracles of Jesus and he said, John the Baptist is risen. And, and because of my beheading of him, he is now showing forth these miracles. The other example was Elias, and it was said of John the Baptist that he would come in that same spirit of Elias, and so they were connected in that way. Jeremiah made the statement, a prophet shall you receive like unto me, him shall ye hear. And therefore they thought that this Jesus was just Jeremiah the prophet coming back. Jesus was called a good man. Jesus was called the teacher, master, rabbi by those that were close to him, by those that were of the multitudes following after him. We also have the other side of things, the scribes and Pharisees. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? The disciples could have said, well, the scribes and Pharisees are saying that you're Beelzebub, the prince of the devils, and that's how you do all of these works. They could have reminded Jesus that the day is going to come. I don't think it's the first mention of it. It probably happened previous. But Matthew 27 they're going to say of Jesus, he is that deceiver. That deceiver said while he was alive. And that's fine if these scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, want to call Jesus all of these blasphemous and, and hateful and hurtful names. Jesus had names for them. 
Whom do men say that I am? The scribes and Pharisees say, He's the prince of the devils. And Jesus says, You blind guides, ye fools, ye whited sepulchres, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, ye hypocrites. He turns it back on them. That's who Christ says they are. And that's, that's more of, a, that's more of a, a, a harmful attack than anything to have the Son of Glory say such things about you. That's an indictment. We have the prophecy in Isaiah, in chapter 9, when it talked about that son being born, that child being born to us. Unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And it talks about what his name shall be called. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He was, he was prophesied to have these character traits. This isn't necessarily a name here, but a reputation of who Christ is. But the question still remains. Whom do men say that I am? And they give a few examples. He continues then in verse 15, And he saith unto them as they respond, John the Baptist, and some Elias, and some Jeremiah, and some, you're just another prophet, and, and some are saying that, that you're a Beelzebub, and some are saying you're a deceiver. He responds and says, But whom do ye say that I am? Whom do ye say that I am? Never mind what they say, who am I to you? To the disciples, he asked them, Who am I to you? Who do you say that I am? Verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the response of Jesus in verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. This great truth comes to us through the pages of the scripture, revealing who Christ is, certainly. But also, I believe this is revealing Peter's heart in Christ and who Peter truly feels Christ is. The question was asked, whom do men say that I am? They respond, Jesus turns it around and says, but who do ye say that I am? Who do you think I am, Peter? And he says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Who is he to you? What has been revealed to you, sitting in this room personally, of Christ? Of his person, of his character, of his glory? What's his name? Who is Jesus to you? Who do ye say that I am? Ask yourself, who is Christ to me? Who do I say that he is? And this was the pointed question that he gave to all of his disciples. Men are calling me what they will. Men have their own understanding. These are unbelievers. This is the world that is looking upon me with a scripture that is veiled before them. They don't understand. And they're saying all of these things about the Christ. And yet here Simon Peter steps forward. He says, thou art the Christ. And Christ says, that's revealed to you not by flesh and blood. And that was clear. Why? Because flesh and blood had already answered who he is. Flesh and blood had already said he's just one of the prophets. Peter says, you're the prophet. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Savior of the world. If you could, you can go back to Matthew chapter 11 briefly. And we'll be back in 16. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11 And in verse 27, Matthew 11, verse 27, it says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. This is saying that the Son reveals the Father. This is saying that the Father reveals the Son, and I believe both of them are revealed by the Word of God and the Spirit of the Father working through the Word of God. We could go back to Matthew 1 and Matthew uh, verse 1 and verse 16, 17, 18. We could go back to Matthew chapter 2 and in verse 4. We could go back to Matthew chapter 11. You can do that in verse 2 right there. Matthew 11 verse 2, and it says, Now... When John had heard in prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. The previous references were the narrator talking about the Christ. This is Jesus that was to be called Christ. This is the Christ, the narrator being the Spirit of God. 
Now here we have again the narrator saying, John heard the, in the prison the works of Christ and he sent two of his disciples. And now back in the context of Matthew chapter 16, and in verse 16, we have Peter's great revelation. He says, thou art the Christ. And to this point, even in the book of Matthew, or yea, even the New Testament, no one, flesh or blood, has revealed that truth. So when Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus answered and he says, flesh and blood haven't revealed this to you, even the pages of the scriptures give us an affirmation to that truth. Peter in this moment had this revealed to him, or he had it revealed to him previous and he never actually spoke the thing. He never actually confessed this confession. Jesus says, the Son reveals the Father. Jesus says, the Father reveals the Son, the Father being in heaven. Jesus says, flesh and blood can't reveal such a truth. But here in this moment, Peter realizes he's the Christ, and here in this moment, he confesses that very thing. Verse 18, it says, And I say, un I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shalt be loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Here Jesus, as Peter confesses who he is, Jesus confesses who Peter is. You are Peter. Indeed, this is who you are. And he says, and upon this rock will I build my church. Now, I don't believe that is alluring, alluding specifically to Peter himself, but rather the rock that followed them in the desert. The Bible says that several places where it says that rock which followed them was Christ. That rock which they hit, they, they smote, and waters gushed out was Christ. Jesus was there as the rock, the firm foundation of the church in all times in human history. But here Peter is professing he's the Christ. Jesus says, on this rock, and I believe that's the profession, on the Christ, the Son of the living God, the first time that was revealed unto men by the Spirit, is the, is the first time Jesus actually begins to hand over the authority unto his church that he died for. The Son reveals the Father. The Father reveals the Son. Not flesh and blood. And this profession of truth, who am I, the Christ, gives them power of which the gates of hell cannot prevail over. This profession... Who am I? The Christ, the Son of the living God, gives Peter here authority to bind and to loose, and whatsoever is done in either way is settled in heaven. Peter here is giving authority based on the profession of Christ that he has. So whom do ye say that I am? That's a good question, because I believe here that God is indicating there is a special revelation to each person individually. Now there is here... The overlying truth, Peter professes he's the Christ, the Son of the living God. And upon this rock, that profession of you, Peter, Simon, son of, Simon, son of Barjona, or son of Jonah, Simon, Barjona, as it were, you are Peter, and upon this profession, I give you power. Upon this profession, I give you authority. And then look at this in verse 20. It's interesting. He says, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man, that he was Jesus the Christ. This great revelation for the first time came off of the lips of flesh and blood. Jesus encourages Peter and said, Blessed art thou. Amen. That's a wonderful revelation. And that came directly from the Father. He says, Upon that profession, Peter, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not stand against it because you'll be given power. He says, I will give you the authority to bind things on heaven and on earth and whatsoever you choose, that's how it will be established. Based on that profession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he goes and he says to the rest of the disciples, don't tell anybody this. And you're left scratching your head. Isn't this a great truth that we should publish from the housetops? Why would he tell his disciples, tell no man of this? For what purpose and what end? 
Well, in the context here, it says the Son reveals the Father. It says the Father reveals the Son. And it says that flesh and blood cannot do either. Okay, we grab that from the previous mention, talking about how, how Jesus there in, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 27, we've already read through this, so we should know about this as we're going through chronologically the Bible. He says, Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And here he says that the Father reveals the Son as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Flesh and blood can't do this. And to this moment in Matthew, flesh and blood hasn't done this. So in that same way, when he charges his disciples not to go and reveal this unto men, he's saying that because it's impossible for them to do so. Flesh and blood cannot reveal these things. So what's happening here? He's saying that the Father desires to reveal to you who the Son is. The Son desires to reveal to you personally who the Father is. Flesh and blood can't do that for you. So again, we ask that question. Who do you say Jesus is? What has Jesus said, or what has the Father said to you of who Jesus is? That's the starting point for having Jesus reveal to you who the Father is. You will get more understanding and it will be personal. Because I can't stand up here as flesh and blood and tell you that truth. I can't give you that blessed art thou profession that Peter just had come to his mind and out of his heart and, and through his lips. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I can't teach you that. We can read it. We can understand that. But every one of us is going to have, I believe, that same moment where we fully understand, who am I to you? Christ comes to each and every one of us, I believe, and asks that same question. Yeah, but who do you say that I am? The world is professing that you are just another prophet. The world is saying that you were a good man. The world is saying that he was a deceiver. But who do you, Christians, say that Jesus is? That's personal, and that's only going to come by way of the Father revealing it to you. I believe that. The Word of God, through the power of the Spirit of God, is going to be what leads you to understand who Jesus Christ truly is. We can have a soul winner come and show us the gospel, and we can say that Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, died on the cross after living a sinless life for your sins, and we can give them a little bit of an illustration of his life, the miracles that he did. We can show that he was born of a virgin. We can give all sorts of character traits of Jesus, but ultimately, they'll get saved based on their profession and belief and faith in what we told them, but I believe it's going to take a little while before they come to the point where they really understand who is Jesus to me. I've been saved by the Son of Man. I've been born again by the Son of God. And certainly by this point, the disciples knew they were sealed and saved and, and believed on him and trusted on him. But now he's asking them that really important, that really probing, that really deep question. Yeah, but who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? And that's one that's going to take time to uncover. And it's going to take us being ready to reveal what the Father shows us through His Spirit. So, of course, the Word through the power of the Spirit of God leads you into all truth. And we know that to be the case. We can grab a hold of that in John chapter 14. Go to John chapter 14. Just a little taste of the ministry of, of the Spirit of God here, John 14. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that somebody's going to have one interpretation of God. Christ and another person is going to have a different interpretation of Christ because he's just revealing different things to different people in different ways. The world actually teaches that, that Jesus would go to a Hindu people and teach them a Hindu type of religion. And he would go to the Buddhist people and teach them a Buddhist type of religion. And everyone have some sort of weird different interpretation of who Christ was. That's not what I'm talking about here. That's certainly what the Antichrist will do. He'll come bringing one religion which will fit all of the molds. And everybody will be able to come together and sing Kumbaya under that Antichrist system. But what I'm talking about is a deeper understanding of who God is to you. And that will come to each one of us personally, but it will come not as a private interpretation. No, no, no. There's no private interpretation. It will come as a private revelation, I believe. In other words, it will be revealed to you 
through the pages of the scriptures, the Holy Spirit of God interpreting the scriptures and explaining to you plainly in a language that you can understand and profess just like Peter did. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's who he is to me. And we could say in our own vernacular, I could say, you are the Christ and you're the one that pulls me through. You're the one that helps me to overcome. You are Whatever Christ is to me in particular is what God's going to reveal himself as to you. And that's going to be through the Spirit of God. And of course, that will always line up with the truths that are contained in Scripture. John chapter 14 and verse 4, the Bible says, And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Okay, he's thinking carnally. He's thinking that this is a direction, a, 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 a path that they need to walk on in this physical realm. Verse 6, though, Jesus clarifies. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way. Thomas is like, we don't know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way. Oh, well, we know you, Jesus. He continues, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, have I been so long time with you? And yet, hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me, or sorry, he that hath seen me, yes, hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Now that's not saying that the Father is standing there in front of him. No, because the Father is in heaven. We've already saw that in the previous context in Matthew chapter 16. The Father which is in heaven. But what that is saying is, if you've seen me, You've been revealed me of the Father. And if you've seen the Father, you've had me reveal the Father unto you. And the working of the Spirit is really what propagates this whole activity here. Verse 15, it continues and says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you ever, even the Spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And we have that blessed promise today where the Spirit of God is abiding with us because Christ went to be with the Father. And not only that, if you believed on Jesus Christ to the saving of your soul, he abides in you. And he has the ministry not only to the world to bring them unto conviction, to draw them unto God the Father so that they could have that same truth revealed to them, but he also has the ministry within those that have already believed unto life everlasting. Verse 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Look over in chapter 15 and verse 26. And it says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Look at The Father's Spirit is coming and testifying of the Son. And that's exactly what we saw. When Peter confessed, that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. That was the Father using his arm of the Spirit of God to come down to this earth and to teach that to Peter so he could profess it. Peter didn't learn that in Bible college. Peter didn't learn that in his walking with the Lord. Peter didn't learn that as he viewed John the Baptist from afar or went down to um, the, the temple to learn from the Pharisees if he ever took part in that. Peter didn't learn that from flesh and blood. He learned and had revealed to him who the Son was through the ministry of the Spirit of truth, the Comforter there that abides with them. But now, what a blessing, we have the Comforter abiding in us, continuing in that same ministry, revealing all truth unto us, whatsoever we have heard Christ say. Look at how they're all working together. It's a, it's a little hard to kind of wrap your head around, but we have, we have you know, Jesus revealing who the Father is, the Father using the Spirit to reveal Christ in us. We have Jesus, who's the Word of God, the way, the truth, the life, that has the pages of Scriptures here before us. And as we read them, the Spirit brings those into remembrance and confesses back that uh, of, of Christ and, and talks about Him, testifying of Him. They're all working together, and ultimately that is... The, the triune God in his essence. They, they are working together, though, though different. 
working together, though separate. It's something that you cannot wrap your head around. I cannot wrap my head around. I couldn't get a whiteboard up here and draw him to you. Because so many times you, you hear things that seemingly contradict one another, but that's just God exemplifying the fact in the scriptures that he's bigger than us. And we got to just eventually buy into what he's saying completely and 100% by faith. Here we clearly see Father, Son, Holy Ghost doing different things, yet working in the same direction, doing the same things and yet doing them in different ways, pointing to one another and affirming one another and encouraging the believer in the whole of the triune trinity as we call it god the godhead and it's confusing but hey it's good it's 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 wonderful it's perfect amen i love to have it so and he reveals to us here how we come to know the father through the son and how we come to know the son through the father the spirit of god basically enabling all of those activities to take place john chapter 16 and verse 13 continues and it says how be it when he the spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he will receive of mine and shall show it unto you. That's Christ talking. The spirit will glorify me, Jesus says. All things that, are, that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So Christ, the word, who he is, who am I to you? Everything that Christ is, is the Father's. Here he says, the Spirit's going to take of what his and show it to us, and then we will be blessed as a result of it. This is, this is very interesting stuff, a little bit complicated. Again, I can't draw it out, but I love to hear these words and how they all work together, the three persons of the Godhead. Now, <clears throat> of course, we're told of the word, it can be revealed to us plainly in black and in white and in speech. Like I can just, I can explain what I just explained to you best I can. But I obviously always fall short. At some point in my explanation, if I kept going on and tried to connect all the dots of this, somebody's going to zone out and be like, eventually, I, I'm lost, right? Why? Because flesh and blood can't reveal this stuff. This is, this is the bottom line. I can do my best to take what is here, black and white, on the pages of my Bible and expound it unto you. But ultimately, when the bottom line, the, the, the lowest shelf, when you, that question is asked, whom do ye say that I am? That's completely personal. And this is the problem with us trying to take a doctrine as complicated as, who am I? When Jesus asks it. Take a doctrine so complicated and lay it out in a, in a statement of faith and say, you must adhere to this or you're some sort of reject. You're, you're reprobate. You don't understand the Bible. It's so hard to take something so incredibly complex as, who am I? Christ asking us that. And make it dogmatic. And the Bible is just showing us why. Why? Because the, the ministry of the Father reveals the Son. The ministry of the Son reveals the Father. The Spirit enables all of that activity to go on. And ultimately, I can't give you what God is going to reveal you to you of His person. To whom shall reveal it, receive it? That's completely personal. I believe that. And that's why God said, don't tell any man who the Christ is. Do you know what they were charged to go and tell people? You look at the end of the book of Matthew. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way in the, even unto the end of the world. Even then they weren't commanded to go and to reveal who Jesus was in this complex sense. Whom do ye say that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that each one of us have God asking us that same question as we walk this walk. And ultimately, what is revealed or uncovered to each one of us specifically and specially will be like as unto nobody else. In other words, how God impacts me, changes my life, influences me, does things in me. How I see him and the, the great impact of him in my life. Who he is in my life and how he works in my life is going to be completely unique to me than it would be to you. Now when we come together, all of us should be able to be in unity. We should all agree that he is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
We should all agree that he's the savior of the world. We should all agree that even as it's revealed here in the pages, he's the Christ, the son of the living God. We should all agree on what is plain and written in the scriptures, but I'm talking about something a little bit more intimate than that. And this is, again, another key to being a fisher of men is that you personally, specifically, and uniquely know your father. You specifically and particularly and uniquely know the Son. You specifically, particularly, and uniquely know the Spirit of God and how they work in your life and how they speak in your life and what their voice is. And that's something I can't teach you. I can't teach you to be intimate with God. I can't teach you to have a relationship with God. I can't teach you to love God. I can't teach you those things. Flesh and blood cannot reveal who God is to an individual. The Spirit of God has to do that. The Father has to do that. The Son has to do that. And that is their ministry. Do you know what our ministry is? To receive what's revealed, and that's it. We take what the Spirit of God is teaching, and we receive of it. And we accept it by faith, and we walk further in that. We take what the Spirit of God reveals to us, and we accept it, and we walk in that. And you know what? I think today I've got more of an understanding of who God is to me than I did five years ago. And I think today I have more of an understanding of who God is to me and what he's revealed of himself to me than I did 10 years ago. We ought to always be growing in those things. And then we see the Apostle Paul at the very end of his life, and he's still saying, oh, that I could know thee and the power of Israel. He desired to know God. And at that time, Paul had been through so much in walking with the Savior, even having, his minist- having the Savior minister to him in person for a time as he walked on that road and was about to go and persecute Christians. He spent time with the Lord there, got to know him in those moments where he said, why persecutest thou me? Who am I to you? (laughs) Is, Is another way I think he could have put that. Paul called him Lord in that moment. And then Paul began a journey to where he became one of the greatest Christians of all. And in the end he said, oh, that I may know God. Paul, what are you talking about? You've, you've expounded unto us so many things in the scripture. You've, you've, you've pointed us to Jesus. You've told about who he was and what he did. Certainly you know God and he's like, I don't know him yet. I want to know him. And that won't be full. That won't be entire. That won't be complete until we eventually see him face to face. But for now, forget those things we're behind, press on towards the mark. And Paul's mark was knowing Christ. Who am I to you? Christ asks each and every one of us. Who am I? Men say all sorts of things. Ten years ago you would have said something else, but today, who am I to you? Jesus Christ asks us. Again, not some private interpretation of the scriptures. No, whatever conclusion you come to about who Jesus is, it will always be complemented by the scriptures. Why? Because it's, 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 it's act- actively per- pushed by, by the scriptures. The action of knowing God comes from the Word of God because it's the Father's Word that Spirit took, teaches you, brings it to remembrance all things that Christ taught. And so we're always going to be conformed to what the Bible says. Of course, of course, of course. We're not saying that there's going to be some private revelation and someone's going to come and say, you know, I believe Jesus is this and I believe Jesus is that and this whole room will be divided on who he is to us. No, no, no. But there will be little things that are personal and maybe we don't even share. Little things that that God has done in our life. Little special moments. We understand how he talks whenever I do this. And I understand how how he leads whenever I do this. I understand of God in my walk with him that he likes to meet with me at 4 a.m. Sometimes I don't have a sermon until 4 a.m. on Sunday. And I get up and I'm tired and I'm groggy and I can't manage. And I can't deal with being awake that that, at that time. But that's when God comes and he says, okay, here's what you're going to say today. Here's what you're going to preach. Here's the book you'll be in. I know that of God, but I want to know more, and I want to have more revealed unto me. And that's growth, and that will take time. So he says, tell no man, because honestly, no man can tell you thoroughly what we're talking about today. And this is a little bit deeper of a truth than just on the surface, but you'd expect it to be so. When was it when Jesus first said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men? Way, way, way back there at the beginning of Matthew. And they've been following for a while, haven't they? There's been all sorts of lessons along the way. Christ says, follow me, follow me, follow me. And he's actually getting to the point, he's about to reveal unto them that he will suffer, that he will be be killed of the scribes and the Pharisees. 
They're coming to the end of the teaching. And Jesus is saying, here today, the most important thing I want you to learn is, who am I to you? Think about that. Who do men say that I am? Yeah, yeah, that's nice. But who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. They charged, Jesus charged the disciples saying, tell no man. You're not going to tell it well enough. Flesh and blood can't reveal these things. that That a personal walk and talk with God could. Ephesians chapter 3. In verse 1. It says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word. So he's dispensing grace. He's giving out grace. He's teaching of the grace of God. Verse 3, it says, How by that revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So, Here the Apostle Paul begins addressing the Ephesian church and he says, you've begun to hear of the dispensation of the grace of God. We're handing out the grace of God, teaching it to you, not only in in our activities, but here he says, he wrote unto them in a few words about this mystery. He says, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So you may grasp a little bit about the mystery of the knowledge of Christ, a little bit of the mystery of knowing Christ and what that means to an individual. The Apostle Paul here is saying, and I like how he says in a few words, <laughs> indicating I think that it would have taken many words to, to fully fully highlight what he's trying to explain, but didn't have the time or didn't, didn't wasn't able at that time to expound it fully. But if we continue on over in verse 14, He begins to get to the bottom line of why he's writing. He says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I wrote unto you in a few words that you can understand the mystery. But for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15, Of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit, in the inner man. The Apostle Paul here has written unto them a few things. And if you read the first bit of Ephesians, he's talking about victory in Christ. He's talking about how we're saved by grace through faith. He's talking about how we can be overcomers and powerful in the name of Jesus Christ. He's talking about all of these things and highlighting and lifting up his grace and his wonderful redemption through his blood and all these things that are provided for us. And he says, I wrote unto you in a few words these things. He's like, but now I'm on my knees. He's like, I'm on my knees in verse 16 that God would grant you, according to all the riches, that you could be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And the inner man is truly our battlefield. That's where we really want to get the most spiritual growth done. He says in verse 17 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. So Paul's on his knees... Don't you think he could have made a list or could have wrote some more words and said, okay, this is how you get Christ in your hearts. Well, here's one. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. That's one way to get filled by the Spirit. But the Apostle Paul doesn't take this opportunity to write more on that. He simply says, I'm on my knees. That God would reveal himself to you. That Christ may dwell in your hearts. And what is more intimate than Christ abiding in your very heart, your very core, all that you are? He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith and you being rooted and grounded in love. In other words, you've dug deep. You're firm in this. I want Christ to be all of these things for you that you may be able to comprehend some things. But he's not doing it through teaching now. He's not doing it with flesh and blood revealing it unto these people. He's doing it on his knees. He says that you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And I love that phrase because it talks of something beyond this world. Remember, flesh and blood can't reveal this to you. And Paul wants us to comprehend something that is not of this world. Something that flesh and blood can't 
reveal unto us. And why do I say that? Well, we deal in length and width and height. That's our three-dimensional world. That's this pulpit here. You can measure it in that way. But here we have a fourth dimension, do we not? Length, breadth, height, depth. There's something more that the Apostle Paul wants his people to comprehend here. He wants them to know Christ. And the only way for them to know what he's talking about, something spiritual, is to have it revealed to them by the Spirit. Christ revealing the Father. The Father revealing Christ. The Spirit of God working in them. Flesh and blood can't reveal it unto you, Peter, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. But my Spirit can. My Father can. And I can through my word. That's what he's saying here. This is what the Apostle Paul is on his knees for. He wrote in a few words, of course. But now he's just praying. We need to know for ourselves who Christ is to us. And we need to pray that others would have that same revelation. We need to pray that we ourselves would have more of that revelation and comprehend truly the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of this love that God is putting forth. Verse 19, it says, And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. This is great. Know the love which ye cannot know. <laughs> be filled with the Spirit, completely full, with all the fullness of God. Filled with the fullness of God. God's everlasting. God's eternal. God's beyond what we can even imagine, think, comprehend. And here the Apostle Paul is asking on his knees that the Father would give unto his saints Christ in a way that's completely incomprehensible and impossible. <laughs> God, would you make them to know which they cannot know? God, would you fill them with something that never ends? Verse 20, Now to him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Again, Peter had this revelation of who Christ was when Jesus asked him that pointed question. Who do you say that I am? Who am I? We've got to ask ourselves that same question. Who is Christ? If I don't know, I want to know. If I think I don't know, if, if there's more that I need to know, and honestly, we're all there. Remember the Apostle Paul said that. I haven't apprehended. I haven't attained. He knew that he needed more of him. He needed that. He needed more of that love. It's a good place for us to be in is to fully comprehend that we cannot comprehend apart from the Spirit of God. And I stand up here week after week and do my best to show you what the love of Christ is and, and, and who he is and what he wants for you. But I can't. <clears throat> to put that expectation on any man. You know, if, the, if, if, a, if a wife is like, I'm counting on my, my husband to show me who God is. If a husband says, I'm, I'm counting on my wife to reveal to me what the Spirit of God is. I'm, I'm counting on my preacher. I'm, I'm counting on mom or dad. I'm counting on somebody else to show me. I'm reading all these books and I want to know God. I want to truly know God. Someone goes and writes a self-help book that says, Know God. It's, it's already, a, you know, it's, it's a paperweight at best. Knowing God is, is knowing His Spirit and His truth and how it works in you. And it's a personal thing. Not some private interpretation, but seek after that private revelation. God revealing Himself to you. And I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for me. Pray for one another that God would do the impossible. Help us to know the unknowable. Help us to fill with all fullness who he is. Because he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And that's just us having big faith to know that God will do what he intends to do and can do beyond what we can even comprehend. I don't know about you, but I want to know him. 
I want to follow him as he reveals himself to me and then put those things behind and then follow him again as he reveals himself to me and then put those things behind and press on and press on and press on and seek after that prize of the high calling of God which is in Christ Jesus. I want to know him so much that I'm eventually just fully in him, in heaven, abiding with him, face to face, seeing him, him seeing me, being his body. That's intimacy. That's closeness. That's knowing God. We're not there yet. The Apostle Paul at the end of his life hadn't attained. I'm a far way across from, a, away from where the Apostle Paul was at that time. But by the grace of God, every day we'll get closer and closer and closer and closer as he reveals himself more and more and more and more in us. And that's a blessing. I'm thankful for it. When we do, when we follow him, it'll be impossible for us not to catch men. Why? Because... I know the one that wants to see you, seek you, save you. I know him personally, and this is what he wants for all men everywhere to repent and to turn to him. Amen. Thank you, Father. For